today I'm going to just talk to you about PowerShell and uh, tell you where I think we are. Okay, so it's 2018, and here's the answer. PowerShell has never been more important. Okay, I'll try and explain that to you. So we used to say that, you know, the cloud changes everything, but actually that's not quite right. In fact, because the cloud, that's a very technology-oriented worldview. In fact, it's the digital transformation that's changing everything. And I'll talk a lot, you know, digital transformation. It's one of those words. What the heck does that mean? I'll be very precise about what I mean about digital transformation. But I'm going to tell you that it is the thing that is changing everything. And here's why PowerShell is so important. It's because automation is what drives and fuels digital transformation. There is no digital transformation without automation. So, to explain digital transformation, the way I like to think of it, it is putting your customer value proposition at the center of everything and having the courage to refactor everything in your company to optimize for it. Okay, that's it. And we believe that through software, we can provide transformative customer experiences. So that's the heart of it. One, technology, software, can deliver transformative experiences, right? Transformative. You are so much more competitive. Uh, you earn a lot more market share. You generate a lot more revenue. Your competitors do worse and that you have the courage to be able to go do whatever it takes. Now, Jeffrey Moore made this very clear. He had talked about this idea of core versus context, okay? And what he said was that uh, everything a company does is one of these two things, core versus context. Now, core are those activities that provide value to your customer, that you're able to charge a premium for, and that differentiate you from your competitors. And context is everything else. So to be concrete, Microsoft, our core is software. Our context, everything else. We have to have cafeterias, we have to have shuttles, we have to have receptionists. But Satya Nadella never sits his senior leadership team down and say, okay, we gotta figure out what to put on the lunch menu next week, right? It's very important, we write a big check for that stuff, but it's stuff we don't wanna pay attention to, okay? And so then there's this idea of like, well, there's mission critical and everything else. It's another access. And so what you want to be doing is you want to focus all your energy on the core, but this mission critical context is an area of risk. And so you might ask yourself, well, if it's, if it's by the way, the definition of mission critical, definition is if you screw it up, you're in big trouble, okay? So how could something be mission critical but context? And the answer is this, if you have something that's core, you've done a great job, you're able to deliver great customer value and charge a premium for it, at some point and somehow the marketplace will respond, okay? It'll respond with a substitution, with an alternative, et cetera, and it's still mission critical, you still generate a lot of revenue from it, but it's not differentiated. Okay, and that's why companies have to continue to hit refresh on themselves, generate new products, etc. But you can't screw up the old products, okay? And so the reason why it's a risk is often this is an area where people will increase their investment at a time they can no longer provide, you know, uh, get any value from. They can't charge money for this differentiation. So that's an area why it's a risk. So the heart of digital transformation, if you can only remember one thing, it is you want to build the things that advance your mission, that distinguish you from your competitors, and things that you can charge a premium for, and then you want to buy everything else. You just want to write a check, get it, move on, okay? Now, great. How do you do that? I go to this conference, I hear about this digital transformation, I'm totally in. What do you do? Go to your boss and say, hey, give me some more people. Like, digital transformation's really important. How many people think they can go to their bosses and just ask for more people and get them? I know that one. Ooh, I want to talk to you. <laughs> this guy, he's got a good boss. I like that. Most people cannot do that, right? Most people, this is not a successful strategy. And yet, we, you know, digital transformation is such a business imperative, we must do it. 
So how can we do it? And the answer is this. The people that are going to be successful at digital transformation are those that can create bandwidth out of what they're doing today and then invest that in bandwidth in innovation. Okay, it's that simple. You have the resources you have and you have to manufacture success with those resources. Now, how do you do that? The answer is, as managers, you really only have two degrees of control. The first is culture, right? How do we approach our work? How do we approach the task, et cetera? What sense of urgency do we bring to every day? And the second is resource allocation. How do I assign my resources to particular tasks? And with those two tools, you need to both create bandwidth and invest in innovation. So let's talk about creating bandwidth. There are really three strategies to creating bandwidth. Number one is software as a service. There are a number of things that you can buy as a service and you ought to just do that. Here's the thing, exchange, email, absolutely mission critical. And I can guarantee you almost no one in this room, different, their company is not differentiated from their competitors because you run email better, right? Uh, airplanes, you can't put more people on an airplane because you run your email service better than the other airlines. Doesn't happen. But it's mission critical. So by just doing a software as a service, uh, you write a check, you get that, and then you create bandwidth because your people are no longer managing Exchange or whatever the software is, team services. There's any number of things that you can get as software as a service. Then there's lift and shift. Lift and shift is where you take a, a, a physical server or a virtual machine and you run it in the cloud. And just by running it in the cloud, you create bandwidth. And why? And the answer is that the clouds, ours, the competitors, anybody's, uh, they provide a set of great management tools for that that you then don't have to evaluate, buy, uh, run, maintain, et cetera, right? They provide that for you. And then, of course, automate, automate, automate. Everything that you automate allows you to free up resources that you can then invest in something else. And what do you do? You invest them in automation. Now, our innovation. With innovation, you want to use cloud architectures. Don't just take the way we used to do things and do it again, okay? When you have this opportunity to innovate, take advantage, learn, invest in these new cloud architectures, things like serverless, Azure Functions, Logic Apps. These new architectures really do allow you to focus more on the customer than on the mechanics of how to write an application. So you invest in those things. You really want to embrace DevOps. DevOps is the unification of the developers and the operator tools. Anybody go to any DevOps conferences? Okay, a few. Very important, very important stuff. When you go to a DevOps conference, however, it's very easy to get lost into this quagmire of what is DevOps. I can guarantee you there's a lot of topic, time spent on that topic and no one ever walks away saying like, oh, now I got it figured out. But to me, DevOps is really only two things. So first is DevOps is do your work in small batches very frequently and go fast so that you learn. Small, frequent batches so that you can learn. And number two is stop being a jerk to your fellow workers, okay? If you're in operations, stop being a jerk to the developers. If you're a developer, stop being a jerk to the op operators. Yeah, can I ever, right? It, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you stop being a jerk. <laughs> But really, that's, that's it for DevOps. And these two things are very important, right? Very, very, but then what else do you do? And the answer is you automate, 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 okay? Now in the first side, you're automating because it creates bandwidth. But when you're invest innovating, you're automating so that you can go faster. You can go faster with higher reliability, with higher predictability, with higher quality. Once you can automate a process, you can measure it and then you can change the sequence and you can measure it again. And if the measurement is better, you keep the change. And if the measurement is bad, you back out the change and then you do it again and again and again. So automation 
is the key to driving your processes to success. Now, being excellent, I will tell you this digital transformation is unlike uh, any technology revolution we've had before, because before we would be you know, a little bit more productive, cooler technology, et cetera. But what excites me so much about digital transformation is it's all about the customer. And that if we get the customer right and we line up everything, the value that we can generate is so transformative. So a true and what that means is that your company will beat the competition. If you can beat the competition, guess what? There's more money for more promotions, et cetera. If you're one of the key leaders behind this digital transformation, guess what? You get rewarded, okay? So that's why. So excellence at digital transformation is all about winning but excellence at automation means winning, okay? That's why PowerShell is so important now, more so than at any point in the past. So, great, Jeffrey, I'm in. It's just Windows PowerShell, right? I'm here, I got it, got it nailed? And the answer is no. Windows PowerShell is all about Windows. Okay, as one Microsoft executive once told me, as I tried to bring a command line interface to Windows, he said, Jeffrey, exactly what part of effing Windows is confusing you? <laughs> so, no, Windows, is, this is, Windows PowerShell is about Windows. And the world is heterogeneous, okay? Now, there's a lot of great, there's a great role for Windows in the future, but I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of microservices, a lot of great cloud frameworks that are on Linux as well, okay? So the world is gonna be heterogeneous. It's not gonna be an all Windows world, and it's not going to be an all Linux world. It's gonna be a mixture of these worlds. And if you think about it, a lot of our management in the past has been very focused in on go find that machine and manage that machine, but I'm here to tell you that managing services is just, and in some cases, more important. And really the cloud requires much better programming in the large, and I'll drill into that in particular because I'm finding those problems as I use PowerShell, so I'll talk about that. So really, a new tool was needed. <laughs> like, dude, dude, what about your sacred vow? I mean, you stood up here and you told me if I learned PowerShell, you made a sacred vow to me that you'd do everything to make sure that that, was a, that investment in learning would be used going forward. And the answer is, yeah, so it is. It's just about PowerShell. And here you see we scratched out the windows. Okay, so we now have a new mission for PowerShell. We could have gone and built a brand new tool, but we said, really, we don't need to. We just need to modify the tool that we have. And you'll see it has a new mission for PowerShell, and that is to support the digital transformation. So specifically, to be able to go from any device, Windows, Linux, Macintosh, manage any server or service running on a, any cloud, uh, Azure, AWS, Google, uh, or on-premises using any hypervisor, Hyper-V or VMware, running any storage or any networking. The tool to manage anything. That is the thing. And you'll see that we had to make a number of changes to make this true, and not all of those changes were compatible with Windows PowerShell. So your skills are all applicable, but uh, not all of your scripts will be, okay? So, hey, great, but what about Windows PowerShell? And the answer is, at this point, Windows PowerShell is complete, okay? <laughs> uh, we will, it is fully supported and probably will be forever. If you think about command.exe, command.exe was uh, uh, formally deprecated, I think in 2008, right? So over 10 years ago, and, and it's still fully supported. So being deprecated, saying deprecation, the definition is that we no longer invest in new features. It's supported, we do bug fixes, we do secure blocking bug fixes, we do security fixes, uh, but no new features. And then, some deprecated things, if nobody uses them anymore, we stop shipping, but uh, PowerShell, people are gonna use forever, command.exe, people are gonna use forever, they'll always ship. So it really just means no feature development, security fixes and customer blocking fixes only, 
and that all of our new feature development is focused in on PowerShell. Now, as I mentioned to you, a number of the changes that we had to make, actually pretty small changes, but they were breaking changes, so we decided to give it a new executable name, and so that's why it's PWSH. So Jeffrey, <laughs> PowerShell version six, like what about coverage? Okay, so PowerShell version six is not PowerShell, uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1, okay? So a couple things. First is we did a hit refresh on PowerShell. Hit refresh is where you say, hey, let me step back for a second, evaluate where we are, and keep what is core, and then leave behind the things that don't help us get to the next 10, 15, 20 years. And when we looked at that, we decided we would drop workflows we continue to listen. Hey, is there any pocket of people out there or any pocket of scenarios that workflows are important? And we haven't heard that, so we continue with our plan to drop workflows. Snap-ins, we wanted to never ship snap-ins. There's a long story behind that. WMI, we are shifting to SIM. We've been signaling that for many iterations, uh, so we're dropping that. So things that we wanted to hit refresh on. But then there was the original .NET Core. We're built on .NET. And .NET Core was not as great, as large as the desktop .NET. When we did PowerShell version one, there was a lot of heavy lift, sorry, PowerShell Core V1, which is our V6. There was a lot of heavy lifting because the version one of .NET Core was very, very, very thin. Version two, now out, doubled the API set. And the Windows compatibility pack doubles that again. So we're actually in pretty darn good shape with the APIs. And remember, there's always PowerShell remoting, right? PowerShell remoting always works, and it ensures interoperability. And as you go and say, hey, yeah, that's great, remoting worked great, but I really want you know, native commandlets. I'd like to get these set of commandlets to run on Linux. Uh, there, the best thing, don't come tell me about that. Go talk to the team that delivers those commandlets. In Satya Nadella's customer-focused Microsoft, your voices to those teams is, has far more impact than my telling them to do something. So if there's some teams that you want to do something, go talk to them. So let me give you a demo of our demos. All right, so we have, I'm gonna discuss our module, right? So in PowerShell, we have the well-defined way to get and run things, right? So right now we added auto module loading, so we've kind of masked this, but let's go back to fundamentals. Fundamentals is we've got modules, and you get them by saying list module, and then from there, you can import a module, and having imported the module, you can then call the commandlets in that module. So here's get sim class, and that just works, yeah? Great. So that's really what's the mechanics behind auto module auto loading. But now I'll try and run get app locker policy, and you see that it fails, because I'm in PowerShell version six, and this set of commandlets is not available on PowerShell version six. So what do I do? Well, of course, the first thing to do is to go talk to that team and say, hey, bucko, maybe you're unclear on the concept. You gotta get on PowerShell version six, so you should go do that, tell them that. But still, I want to do it today for you, so what am I gonna do? And the answer is, I've written a new module. I'm working with Bruce Payette. Superstar Bruce is here with us. Let's give it up for Bruce. Bruce, luckily, Bruce, some, we had a speaker cancellation. At the North America conference, he gave his introduction to the history of PowerShell version, you know, the first half. Here he's gonna give both halves, so that'll be fantastic. Anyway, so I'm working with Bruce on something we call our module, okay? So our module, we'll import it. Well, let's, what are the commands there? 
well, look, I've get, we had get module, here I've get get r module. And of course I had import module, now I've got import r module, so what's that? And the answer we had, the in keen insight that Bruce had was the, hey, um, why not just model this as a module running on a remote machine, a remote or, or a local machine running version six? And so, by the way, this will work against remote machines as well. So here I'm gonna say get R module, list available, just like we did before. But now I'm gonna say computer name, and in this case I'm gonna say local host. And I'll iterate all of the Windows, um, or sorry, the Windows PowerShell uh, commandlets, all the 5.1 modules. And this takes a second as we connect, we create a, a local connection, and then we go get all those modules. There's a little bit of housekeeping done, and look at all that. There's a lot of modules there. So now, remember I tried to do the app locker function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import the R module app locker, and now when I run, see the command, I see all my app locker functions. So how's that working? And the answer is, if you're a PowerShell person, you know the answer. It is implicit remoting. So now I run that command, and I have that command. And what actually happened was I gathered up all the, the request, ran it in the remote session, and got the results and displayed them here. So that works great. But then what about Net, get NetApp, or get Net Adapter? That's not there. And so here what I'm gonna show you is that a bunch of the SIM commandlets are compatible with version six. So right now I've got PowerShell version six, I got 367 commandlets. But here what I'm gonna do is I have copy R module. What copy R module does is it says copy all the compatible ones and move them to this location. What it does is it goes out there and finds all of the SIM commandlets and says, I'm pretty sure that those are all compatible. So it copies them. I also have a whitelist. We're working on a whitelist that you can go and say, yeah, I know, I know that the Hyper-V commandlets work on both. And what we do is we'll copy them and then they'll be available locally. So now, before I did this, I had 367 commandlets, and after I run this, it takes a while because I have so many. Come on back, baby. I have 1,800 commandlets, okay? So now, if you recall, get net adapter didn't work, and now, now it does, okay? So here I get the list of available, and you'll see all those SIM commandlets. Like there's a lot of modules there. So now that's all available. Now, last thing I'm gonna do is I went to the gallery, and I went and copied all the things that declared themselves to be compatible, okay? Get command. Com. So I went and got all the, uh, all the modules that said that they were compatible with version six. So this is Azure, this is AWS, this is Google, this is VMware. They all, all their commandlets now are available uh, on PowerShell version six core. And this is gonna take a while because, okay, 9,400 commandlets. No. 9,400 commandlets. So, you know, the answer is we got pretty great coverage right now. Okay, so when do you switch to for version 6? Depends on who you are. For users, like when it makes sense. You know, when you have full coverage, when you have what you want, when it makes sense. If you're a commandlet provider, you should r compile against the .NET libraries that allow you to work in both. So there's a way to do your work so that it works in both environments and you just need to test. There's no addition, you don't need to lease two versions. And if you're writing scripts or modules, we encourage you to declare that which uh, environment you support and we encourage you to support both. So, great. So now all you tell me, that all the investments in PowerShell, core PowerShell, what's coming up? And the answer is, I don't know. Like, I, really, I have no idea. And the reason I have no idea is that over 50% of the pull requests came from the community. So what's in version six? Well, I can only tell you the things that we're investing in. And we're being very public about all of our, uh, our uh, planning. It's available on this website. Uh, you can look at that. But I'll talk to you about our motivations. And again, 
you're going to contribute, the community is going to contribute, and what PowerShell version 6 is going to be is a combination of the things we invest in and the things the community invests in. I can tell you where we're going to spend our time and energy, and it's these three areas. First is cloud and service management, programming in the large, and then community feedback. Now, cloud and service management, it's really all about helping people consume the cloud to implement that vision, right? Any client manage anything, we'll have swagger or rest-based commandlets, we'll have a production quality gallery so that it's available everywhere with high availability and low latency, and Cloud Shell, the, availability to, the ability to go to the Azure portal and click and get a shell there that will then manage everything. How many people have seen Cloud Shell? Okay, great, if you haven't, go to the Azure portal. Up at the top, you'll see something that looks like the PowerShell uh, icon. Click it, guess what? You get PowerShell, it's pretty cool. Or Bash if you like Bash. And then the next is to drive features. So kind of a underneath the, behind the scenes, a whole bunch of what you see in Azure is in fact being driven by PowerShell and desired state configuration. So in fact, if you take a look at a VM in Azure and you drill into the details, a whole bunch of the stuff here, right? Change tracking, that's desired state configuration. Uh, inventory, desired state configuration. Update management, um, PowerShell. A whole bunch of these top level features are being driven by PowerShell. And as we do that, we've had to make a number of changes. So the security, right, Azure Security Center, uh, it needed to use a desired state configuration, but it needed to run in environments where managed code was not possible. So we wrote an, a uh, native code desired state configuration engine for them. Okay? So that's what's driving our investment and our changes. Now, I spend a lot of my time these days on something called Azure Stack. Do, do people have Azure Stack in focus? Do you know what it is? So quickly, it is Azure, public cloud, but running on your servers, right, in your own data center. Pretty big task. This is really a programming in large task, right? This is very large, okay? This is a simplified diagram of the internals of Azure Stack, okay, simplified. Now, in fact, of these components here, we are highly available which means that most of these have at least two copies and some of them more than three copies. So that if something goes down, the other one takes over, right? So there's no drama in running your cloud. Now, uh, it, we manage this, we deliver Azure Stack as an appliance, right? It's not a do it your own thing. Here's a set of components, here's a manual, here's a rabbit's foot, best of luck. That's not it. Here, the model is you pick a vendor, you pick a size, they roll it in, they configure it, 24 to 48 hours later, you're running and you have Azure in your data center. Okay, so what's that mean? We did all the, we managed the entire life cycle of this, right? We design it, we deploy it, we configure it, we provision it, we do all the validation, we monitor it, we do diagnostics. When something fails, we'll automate the recovery of that failure and the replacement. We do patching once a month and update with new uh, fixes and new features. We provide business continuity, backup and restore, and we secure this thing. If you haven't seen our talk about securing Azure Stack and you like security, I encourage you to do it. It is phenomenal. So, this is a programming in the large task. There's a lot of moving parts, right? There's four to 16 servers in a stamp. Later this year, we'll have more than one stamp. We have all those components, and you imagine trying to patch all those components in a service-aware way, which is to say, I'm gonna patch everything, and you're still gonna be able to use Azure Stack as you use it. Anybody up for that task? Man, I'm telling you, this is hard stuff. PowerShell runs this entire thing. Seriously, it runs the entire thing. I have over 250,000 lines of PowerShell and desired state configuration. Now this is not the best PowerShell, but I got a lot of it, okay? <laughs> 
And this is not just, you know, a setup and then ignore PowerShell. PowerShell's at the heart of Azure Stack. When you create a VM using the Azure portal pointed at your Azure Stack implementation, uh, every VM, there's an average of 472 PowerShell commandlets that are called to create that VM. Okay, so it is in line, production. And the GIA, just enough administration, is absolutely core to our security model. We have fantastic security of Azure Stack. I mean, I try and be humble, and we always take a challenger mindset, but I'm telling you, it's fantastic, and it's fantastic because of what the team was able to use by using GIA properly, and it's also core to our support. So that's great. It's programming in the large. Now let me give you a little history here. Before Azure Stack, there was something called Cloud Platform Solution. We did that. They were first instance, they were not able to use desired state configuration because we were just building it. When we went to do the second version of that, I said, hey, you got to use desired state configuration and PowerShell. And what they came, the team came back and told me was, I hate PowerShell. I don't want to use PowerShell anymore. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why is that? Because this is the tool meant to solve the problem you have. So if you hate it, that's a problem. And what we discovered was PowerShell is great for a set of things, but when you do this programming in large, it had some real challenges. In particular, the devs felt that they did not have the tools they needed to succeed, right? So these are professional developers trying to use PowerShell to manage this incredibly large things. So first is they didn't have the tools that they used. They used Visual Studio, and they didn't have that. So that led to our investment in Visual Studio support and Visual Studio code support. They didn't have, they are used to defining contracts in terms of classes, right? You can define, we were making them write their contracts between I'm gonna write something and then you're gonna provide it and then you're gonna provide it and then you're gonna provide it and they had to do it through script interfaces and that was very unnatural to them. They wanted to have classes for contracts. So that led to the class work and the new language mode. You know, they just, the idea that you could have a function that had a return statement and it returned that and everything else that emitted to write output, just their head exploded, like what? So the new language mode in classes doesn't have that problem. They needed linting tools, so we gave them pest, or script analyzer, and they needed unit test, so it gave pester. So when you saw all this stuff, it came about because of this challenge with programming in large. I'll tell you that, okay, so here, again, our simplified diagram, pretty complex. What we do with this is we deliver this appliance experience, right? Like driving a car. Modern cars have somewhere between, um, what is it, uh, 10 and 100 million lines of code in them, right? Nobody gets in a car and starts debugging the code, right? You get in a car, you drive, a light comes on, says put gas in. You stop, you put gas in. You drive a car, light comes on, says put oil in. You put oil in. Same model for Azure Stack. You drive your Azure Stack, light comes on, says replace a disk. You replace the disk. Drive it, light comes on, says replace the server. You replace that server. That's the model. And so that hyper complexity that we showed there and the redundancy, the complexity behind that complexity and the complexity of the desired state con configuration, et cetera, that all, all that hyper complexity is what's required to deliver a very simple experience. And that's your job as well, right? You have to figure out how to take your complex environments and turn it into something simple that other people can consume. Now, with Azure Stack, we still have some challenges with programming large. So one of them is error handling. And so I have a proposal. This is something we're discussing. Uh, and let me show you the gestalt behind this. All right. So here I've got, I'll import this module. And I'll say, what do I have? And I've got two commandlets, test non-terminating error and terminating error. Here's the code so you see it. Basically, non-terminating error, I just stop process three processes. That'll generate three errors. When I test terminating error, I do the same thing, but I say error action stop. Pretty simple. So when I test non-terminating error, you see I get three error messages. 
And if I want to now write out a message saying, I don't like that experience, I just want to write out, I had an error with this, and write it out to the console in yellow, here's the code that I would write, okay? So I'd write this, and I'd say, error action, silently continue, error variable failed, and then I'd enumerate through that, and voila, I get that experience. That's great, love it. And, but now, I want to do test terminating error, and I run it once, and you see got that one error message. But I want to do the same experience I did here, and here's the challenge. Here's the code I now have to write, right? So I got to put it within a try block, I got to catch it, and then I got to sign dollar sign error, you know, something to dollar sign error, but I get the same thing. But I had two code paths, so that's kind of a pain in the butt. So now, what happens for this? Test error. Which code do I write? And the answer is, I don't know. And it gets a little trickier in that sometimes commandlets can write a, a terminating and a non-terminating error. So that's kind of a, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, well, I got this small script and I'm just gonna do this, et cetera. But when you got over 250,000 lines of code, guess what, you want a better solution. And so what we're looking at is something we call on error. And the idea here is that I would say, test non terminating error, PS on error, and I give it a script block. And when you have an error, whether it's a terminating or a non terminating error, you call the script block. And so it's really the same script block, or very similar script block to the one you'd write for the try catch. But so here, for non terminating error, you notice this code's exactly the same. Here you get three error messages. For terminating error, exactly the same thing, I'd get one. And for this test error, you'd write you'd, however many you got. If it was terminating, you get one, 10, 100, whatever. So you run that script block once each time. Then if you wanted to say, well, that's great, but I just want to break on this, well, what you do is you do that. You'd, you'd add a break statement right here. So you'd write this and you break, and then independent of this, however it happened, you'd only get one iteration and then you'd stop the sequence. So that's an example of the sort of coding that you want to do uh, differently. So our challenges, uh, we also need better control over the visibility over scopes and nested modules. There's, uh, we want to be able to do PS breakpoint and break on an error. Right now, what I wanted to do was to catch an error. Okay, so think of this. I'm doing an invoke command across all these different machines, right? 16 different servers, over 30 VMs. And this, my, when I do invoke command, I'm not saying invoke command, run this command. I'm saying invoke command, run this, right? This big script block. And then something goes wrong. Well, how are you going to figure that out? And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to wrap invoke command with something that then, when an error caught, basically produced like a mini dump to catch the stack trace, walk through the stack trace, gather all the state of the environment, capture that, and then send it back to the invoker for analysis. But there's no way to catch the error at the bottom of the stack trace. You can only catch it at the top, which means you, you lose all your diagnostic state. We need to fix that. Classes, I love them, but they are too limited. We focused classes, version one, on desired state configuration providers. That was great, but I need them to do more. I want to use this more extensively. I want to be able to take classes and produce commandlets out of them, and I want to use classes, right? We, we hacked up our own domain-specific languages for lots of stuff. I want to drive that through classes. Classes are the right way to do domain-specific languages. And then what's super important for any service or cloud services is I need fixes and features when I need them. Open sourcing PowerShell was absolutely critical to be able to do this, right? I can't say, hey, I'm stuck, and then wait for another Windows release to get it. The fact that is that when I'm stuck, I need a fix then. So I mentioned it's not about the cloud, it's about digital transformation. And that did automation is what enables digital transformation, right? Use automation to create bandwidth and then to invest that bandwidth and make, in innovation and make sure that it's production quality. 
And so this is why I believe that it's 2018 and PowerShell has never been more important. And it's 2018 and you have never been more important. The fact that you're here means that you are an automation expert or becoming an automation expert. And your skills in driving your company forward are absolutely critical, right? I go to a lot of conferences and I'll tell you, I'm just joyed when people tell me their story about how they learned PowerShell and were able to become a hero for their company and the success that their company and the, that they have achieved because of that. So you've never been more important and your skill set and your automation skills have never been more important. And by the way, if, you're, if your employer doesn't understand that, you might want to consider another employer, right? Seriously. No, I'm serious. You, you, people are very, you people are very valuable, and I'll just tell you, if you go out and ex test that hypothesis, you will discover that. <laughs> I'll just say that. Okay, so what's in PowerShell version next? As I mentioned to you, again, why you're so important? I don't know. 50% of the, of the PRs came from the community. So, you know, what are you guys going to do? What are you going to add to, to PowerShell? Now, a lot of people point, think, well, hey, I'm just a scripter. I don't know C Sharp. I don't want to contribute to PowerShell. There's lots of ways you can contribute to PowerShell, including improving error messages, improving documentation. There's lots of ways to contribute. So, what I ask for you as a community members is that you lean in engage here. Reach out to the people in these rooms, in the room. Uh, one of the best things about these conferences is to meet the amazing people next to you. Uh, they have great skills, they've got great lessons, often they've stepped on rakes that you're stepping on. Yeah, everybody except for Rob, don't pay no attention to him. <laughs> uh, but then build, right? We are important because we build things, we produce artifacts. And the degree to which I build things and I keep it to myself, well, I'm better, but we're not better. So take what you've done and publish it. Often publishing it, you know, sometimes we're shy, it's not that very good. Guess what, you publish it and people will say, hey, what about this, what about this? Or hey, I modified it to do this, do that, and you learn. So publishing is a great way to learn. I don't think I've ever seen anybody, people correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anybody I've seen publish something and then have people say, oh, you're an idiot, that's horrible. That doesn't happen. People say, hey, there's a better way to do it, but they help you. They, in general, everybody's rooting for you to be successful, so publish your stuff. Okay, here's what we've been waiting for, predictions. First prediction is that I believe that PowerShell Core will be renamed PowerShell. Core is sort of a qualifier, and a, what are you trying to say? What we're trying to say is it's about PowerShell. This is the future, etc. And so I expect, and this is not I'm, this is not a reveal. We don't have a plan, but it's just my prediction as we pull a thread on this that we're going to get rid of it and just call it PowerShell itself. There's a module called Ships. Ships. It's important to pronounce the P. Ships. Ships is the simplified hierarchical interface for PowerShell, is that right? Yeah, and this is a way to use, leverages classes and makes it super easy to write namespaces. This is what, where's, where's Ravi? There's Ravi. Ra this is what Ravi used to take the, the, power, the uh, uh, conference schedule here and turn it into a namespace. I think Ships is going to reinvigorate namespaces and you're going to see lots of namespaces everywhere because namespaces are awesome. Uh, by the way, Ravi's going to give a talk on that, so fantastic stuff. Swagger-based commandlets, if you write a REST API and you annotate it with Swagger, uh, we, will be, we will be releasing a tool which will auto-generate commandlets. We th I think these are going to be very uh, widely used as the world moves to a world of microservices. Cloud Shell. Right now, Cloud Shell, you can get PowerShell in the Linux environment or the Windows environment. I predict that in the end, we're just gonna have a Linux environment so that we have a homogeneous set of tools. Now, why do I think we can do that? And the answer is, when you do Cloud Shell, we give you an environment where you run PowerShell to do what? And it's not to manage the thing you're in. You don't run get processes, you don't manage the services. This is a temporary throwaway environment for you to manage Azure and your VMs. 
So it doesn't really matter whether that's Windows or Linux, you have PowerShell, and then you manage remote things. The reason why I think it'll go to Linux only is so that we have a consistent set of tools. I can actually have another team create the environment, and we just provide some tools to them. And then I've got a consistent set of tools with a consistent release schedule. We've had this problem where the Linux guys were ready, and then we told them to wait a couple days until we got the version of the, it's like, uh, that makes no sense. Uh, anyway, so I predict that that will go to Linux only. Uh, I predict that the desired state configuration, that the LCM there, will, that will open source it and that we'll have a hierarchy of these LCMs. Um, and I predict that uh, at some point, at some point, the Linux guys are going to look at this and say, hey, the Linux mindset is shells are just part of the toolkit. We ship with Bash, we ship with K-Shell, we ship a bunch of shells, and uh, the PowerShell looks like an interesting shell. And I predict at some point they'll start to include PowerShell in their distributions. Lastly, I predict that uh, there's this concept of full stack developers, and I believe that there will emerge uh, the notion of a cross stack IT pro, or IT develop, IT person. And cross stack IT person is the person that can manage anything from any environment, right? The ability to say, hey, it's very valuable. I can manage Windows. I can manage Linux. I can manage it on AWS. I can manage it on Google. I can manage it on Hyper-V. I can manage it on, on um, VMware. Because I've invested in a tool that lets me do that. That gives customers and, uh, the agility to say, great, Turns out there's this fantastic framework in this environment, and I'd like to do it. And if the answer is, yeah, we do that, except we got to hire a, a brand new set of IT people, well, that's not very valuable. But if you can say, hey, boss, whatever you want, I can help support you, because I know how to learn, and I have a tool that can help me manage this heterogeneous environment, that's going to become a very valuable thing. Lastly, we are not, Microsoft is not going to take PowerShell version 6 and port it to full.net, but guess what? We're open source. So I predict at some point someone in the environment, uh, in the community, will take our open source PowerShell version 6 and port it to full.net. Um, anyway, so with that, I don't know how we're doing for time. Do we have time for questions, Tobias? Oh, we have time for questions. I didn't. I've been, I've been dreading, you know, this, this thing. I, I gave you a version of this talk in North America last week, and it went 90 minutes. So it's, I had this vision of this thing going off on me. Okay, questions? Seriously? Okay. So the ubiquitous on error thing, um, I looked it up on GitHub, and there are no comments, so is that in some plan, or is it RFC? Yeah, ubiquitous on air. There's no comments on GitHub, so what's the plan here? And the plan is, no, it's something we've been discussing in, in, in the hallway, et cetera. We put a bookmarker there, but in reality, uh, I haven't been driving to make progress on that, because for Azure Stack to use it, I really need all the coverage first. So I need all the Hyper-V, I need the SDN, I need the software-defined networking stuff. I need full coverage before that becomes uh, important to us. So we're investing in other areas. As soon as I have the coverage, though, I'm going to be driving pretty hard on those set of features. Oh. I was just going to point, point out that there is an issue open. And so please comment on it uh, You can take a look at the issue. Um, you talk about implicit remoting. What about the double, uh, second hub? I yeah, what about second hub? Yeah. So the issue is this. When you do remoting, um, we give you a credential that can manage that environment, but then if you want to go off the box uh, to a second thing, um, it doesn't allow you to do that. You, well, it does, but you go with machine credentials, and very few things are set up to be ACLed to allow machines to access things. <clears throat> and so, so that limits what you can do. Uh, when you connect locally to a machine, as I did here, one of the things you can do is you can, there's a switch called Enable Network Access. And what that does is it gives you a token that allows you to go off box as yourself. And so that's what we do. And so in fact, uh, uh, I don't know whether um, 
um, um, Bruce is going to demonstrate it, but in North America he demonstrated the same thing using the Active Directory commandlets. So he was able to run the Active Directory commandlets because when he connected locally, he got a token that allowed him to go off box. Can you talk a little about the recent reorg and how that affects PowerShell? Okay, yeah, a little bit of inside baseball. Most people don't care. Hopefully it doesn't show up to you. Um, at some point when I worked at Tivoli, there was this impending reorg, and I remember being all nervous about it, and some guy, the best advice the guy ever told me, he says, all organizations are temporary. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Anyway, so we, Microsoft reorganizes on a pretty, uh, 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 frequent basis, and we just had another one of those. Uh, this one affected the, the PowerShell team. Our boss, he really had a portfolio business. He had hardware, he had management, he had Azure Stack, he had uh, cost management, so it was a portfolio business, and he decided he wanted to focus in on the hardware stuff himself. So we took that organization and we rationalized it and moved it to a number of different areas. So what that means is that the PowerShell team and all the management stuff now works under Azure Compute. That's a great place to be. Uh, so you can be ensured Cloud Shell is going to be doing quite well. And then there's another reorganization, that even the bigger one, where now Windows uh, has been broken into two organizations. You can think of it as, not quite, but think of it as like the kernel and the user experience, where the user experience is being uh, merged with the office team. So that's a combined you, you know, uh, customer experience team. And then the kernel has moved to Azure. Any more questions? Which ones? Oh, Azure RM. Yeah, so the Azure RM. Um, let's see, so on PowerShell version 6, presumably, yeah. So I've got a drop. I have a drop where they're all working. Uh, they're going to release that, I think, do we, do we, have they been public? Any day now, if they're not public already, they're, yeah. Very yeah, so if they're not already public, they're, any day now, they're going to uh, release, you know, a beta of the full Azure RM commandlets running on PowerShell version 6. Yeah, is that awesome? I just Amuse wanted, Rob. <laughs> just wanted to make one comment about the ship stuff. That's all based on PowerShell classes. So it wasn't, we weren't able to really make it easy to leverage namespaces until we had classes. Yeah, that's another great example where it, 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 namespaces really are a contract complex contract and classes make it easy to express that contract easier. Oh, Azure RM module has been for.net core. What's the name of it? Azure RM. Azure RM dot net core. Net core. That's, it's available for the last six days. And by the way, here's the good news. Right now, there's two modules, one for Windows PowerShell, one for .NET Core. That's going to get merged. Happy days. You know, that'll be merged. There'll only be one going forward. Additionally, at some point, they're going to get rid of the prefix Azure RM, and it'll just be AZ. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> and, and, and of course, for your, that'll break your scripts, except they'll provide aliases so aliases will map to the old namespaces so you won't have to revamp your scripts, but you won't have to type out that long, horrible name. Will there be uh, any updates on the pull server, DSC pull server in the future? In any future? updates on the PSC pull server? Uh, Michael, are you gonna be talking about that? Michael Green's session is gonna go over DSC in detail, um, and I won't give an answer more than that. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry about uh, pressurizing you with this uh, emergency light. You were perfectly well in timing. Wow. Um, let me just come up to you. Go figure. So the plan now is uh, to all have right. a coffee break. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.